The views and opinions of this broadcast do not reflect the views and opinions of Armed Media, Who New Productions and its affiliates. Enjoy the show. Welcome to episode number 121 of All You Can Eat. It's the podcast about deliciousness. I'm your host, Rob Rosenthal, coming to you live uh, from Miami Beach, Florida, where it is uh, very pleasant uh, here. And uh, super glad to be with you this evening. I'm coming at you today um, as a solo artist, if you will. No guest on the program, but a very precise uh, theme. And the theme is sauces. Uh, And the reason I'm, I'm talking about sauces today pretty much everything that you're going to need to know, uh, at least uh, as far as sauce making 101 goes, is because um, I think sauces are super important. I find them uh, also not terribly difficult to make, and yet they uh, they do make a uh, uh, an enormous improvement uh, in your food. I mean, you know when you're having a good sauce because you know you know, you cherish every last bit of it. You save that little bit of bread to dip in that sauce. You go, hey, you know what? That's a good sauce. The sauces make a difference. Today's uh, program, by the way, speaking of sauce, is brought to you by a sauce, and it's a hot sauce uh, known uh, as Ferrelli. F-I-R-E-L-L-I. Ferrelli is Italy's hot sauce. And um, I've had it, I've tried it, and I love it. Now, listen, I'm not, you know how some people are just uh, uh, bananas about hot sauce, they live for it, they have. They can't get hot enough, uh, you know, they, they're putting it on everything. I've never once, to be blunt, I have never once put hot sauce on a piece of pizza. I come from New York City, we have perfectly good pizza, the last thing I'm going to do is put sauce on it. Now, that said, most uh, hot sauces uh, have a purpose, and, uh, and uh, you can use it however it is that you want. It turns out that... Uh, Ferrelli is a different kind of hot sauce because Ferrelli comes from Italy. And it's not like terribly spicy. It's what you would call medium spicy. And one of the things that makes it unique is that they're using like classic local Italian ingredients. So you're going to be finding, um, uh, you know, for example, roasted red peppers. There'll be balsamic vinegar in it. Uh, The very famous Italian Calabria chilies, which are fantastic. There's going to be some porcini mushroom, which is loaded with umami. Sea salt even comes from Italy. Uh, So um, you're going to want to get your hands on, if you like a nice, uh, medium, super tasty, the kind of hot sauce, frankly that you would put on pizza, uh, it's Ferrelli. And you can find them at uh, shop-us.ferrelli.com, F-I-R-E-L-L-I. Italy's uh, hot sauce, uh, real good, delicious stuff, Ferrelli hot sauce. Now, it was Anthony Bourdain, the famed uh, and very missed Anthony Bourdain, who said that uh, an ounce of sauce covers a multitude of sins, and he's not uh, mistaken. The thing about sauce is that, as I said before, it uh, it can really make the fundamental difference. I mean, people are grilling, you know, chicken breasts essentially all the time. You got to get pretty bored with the same stuff. But one of the ways that you can always vary your food is by bringing a uh, you know different flavoring to it. Uh, I'm big on uh, different uh, herbs and spices because um, they instantly transform uh, food, as does sauce, right? So, you know, I'm going to go through about, uh, let's call it 10 sauces with you now. And, uh, you know, it kind of uh, came to me as a perfect subject for tonight's show because uh, tomorrow at this time, I will be giving a class called Sauce Making 101, and the class is uh, brought to you online by the famed uh, 92nd Street Y in New York City, New York. It is the uh, kind of premier uh, cultural institution in New York City. It is iconic, uh, known for uh, uh, hosting uh, all types of kind of amazing programs and, uh, and speakers and lectures and also continuing education program. Uh, for uh, which uh, I teach uh, cooking uh, classes. 
And tomorrow night's class, Source Making 101, is to provide uh, the basics, everything that uh, that you would need to know to kind of make, you know, your own five or ten. You don't have to know, you know, you don't have to know how to make a dozen sauces, but I'll tell you what, a couple of good ones will make a real difference in your cooking repertoire. 92nd Street Y. So if you're listening to this in time, no, it's already too late because that class will have passed, but... Uh, I suppose, I don't know, somewhere there'll be some video somewhere. But anyway, I'm going to take you through uh, now what I intend to uh, present tomorrow evening on the subject of sauces. Now, I, uh, as a cookbook uh, author, uh, obviously I'm cooking. But one of the things that I've told people from the beginning of time is that there are two sauces, maybe three, but certainly two, um, that you should always make yourself rather than buy. One of them is marinara sauce, and the other is vinaigrette, otherwise known in the French cooking school lexicon as sauce vinaigrette. I haven't purchased a bottled salad dressing in uh, over two decades, and the same thing holds for, uh, y you know, marinara sauce. Because I find, basically, that um, when it comes to marinara sauce, there is, not only is it easy to make, I mean, it's like talking about four ingredients, really, uh, it is always uh, consistently and universally better than what you can buy in a bottle or a jar in the store. I would say that if there is one exception to the rule, I'm sure that you can go into a decent uh, supermarket and get you a bottle, get yourself a bottle of uh, Rao's, R-A-O. Uh, they'll make a marinara sauce, and it's it's decent for, uh, you know, it's actually probably the best bottled sauce that you can get run you, I don't know what they're selling it for these days, eight, nine, ten dollars everything's expensive, and it's fine. It still will not be as good as the sauce that you are going, the marinara sauce that you are going to make yourself. Uh, I feel the same way about, uh, about vinaigrette. I am sorry to tell you there is no way that you are ever going to find a vinaigrette in a bottle uh, in the supermarket that will match what you can easily make uh, on your own. And then the third kind of sauce, I feel like you have no choice but to make your own because it's the only way the sauce comes into existence, is what is known as the pan sauce, sometimes referred to as kind of like uh, au jus. And uh, it involves uh, taking uh, the brown bits uh, that uh, sit in the bottom of a uh, pan, whether it be a uh, frying pan, roasting pan, saute pan, whatever, brown bits that are there because you have cooked uh, some type of generally uh, meat or protein, but also vegetables as well in the pan, and they have caramelized, and they have left in the bottom of the pan uh, brown bits, which uh, I would uh, tell you uh, have uh, two names. The official name is Fond, F-O-N-D, but my name is, for it is Flavor Bomb. When you see brown bits in the, bot in the bottom of any pan that you cook in, you say to yourself, it's now time for me to make the sauce. So let's start off with, uh, with, those, uh, with those three sauces, uh, the marinara, the vinaigrette, and then the pan sauce. And then we'll see w whether or not, you know, what else we have time for. Because if we have time, I'm then going to go through some of the, um, um, the other uh, uh, sauces, which include kind of pesto and chimichurri. Pesto, you know, from Italian uh, uh, cooking, from Genoa, and uh, chimichurri from Argentina. These are both green sauces, and both of them, by the way, are uncooked sauces. They require, they actually demand no cooking. Um, I hope that we'll have time, and I will take you through a cream sauce, um, because, uh, y you know, I mean, I don't use a lot of cream sauce, but certainly it's good to have in your uh, repertoire. And uh, then I have a couple of sauces that I think are really worth knowing. Uh, they only require two ingredients, uh, maybe three, uh, but they are super useful to have around the kitchen. Uh, one is what's known as kind of buffalo sauce. This is what they, the spicy sauce that would go on uh, chicken wings, as, a, as an example, from Buffalo Sports Bar fame in New York, the buffalo chicken wings. I uh, can tell you also how to make the, um, what's the other, oh yeah, the mignonette. Uh, so the mignonette in particular, 
uh, would be would be important to know if you if if you like oysters basically or clams because that's predominantly how it's used. But there are variations on the theme that would allow you to use it on so many other things, seafood and fish. And then finally, it, uh, we would not be complete unless we did a little discussion about a dessert sauce. And so for that, I bring you uh, the Nutella sauce, which um, uh, you know you can use pretty much to top almost any dessert, and it basically makes anything that it goes on top of better. Let us start with the, the subject uh, that I said. Well, even before we get into the marinara sauce, here's some general kind of rules that you should know about sauce making. And food in general, I've always said, and I've said it in my book, and I've said it everywhere that I can say it, um, the bottom line is get the best ingredients you can and don't screw them up too much. That, to me, is my uh, premise uh, in cooking. Get the best ingredients you can. Don't mess them up too much. And the fewer ingredients you use... Um, the more important that those ingredients are good ingredients. Now, this applies to most of my cooking since I've written an entire book, Short Order Dead, uh, based on a very user-friendly formula, uh, which I can define in six words, getting the most taste, fewest ingredients, least effort. So if you're going to use the fewest ingredients, it, you uh, have to go out of your way to make sure that those ingredients are real good. Now, this comes into play in, um, in sauce making because when we get into marinara, for example, um, you could make a better marinara sauce than me just by having better tomatoes than I do. So it's just that simple. The other thing about sauce making is while there are certain uh, types of uh, uh, dishes or recipes that require a real specificity of measurement, real kind of like precision in terms of how much of every ingredient goes in, I have to say that my experience in soft making is that you have an awful lot of latitude. You know, uh, uh, let's use the marinara as an example. If you happen to like garlic, you're going to use, you know, a lot of garlic in your marinara. If you don't happen to like garlic, we can make a marinara sauce uh, or a tomato sauce without garlic at all. So there's, there's latitude, I think, not only in terms of um, uh, the ingredients themselves, uh, but also how much of the ingredient we use. Now, as far as the ingredients themselves, um, one of the things that you're going to notice is all the different varieties and, and, uh, and alternatives that you can use when you're making a sauce. For example, the classic pesto is made with basil and pine nuts and Parmesan cheese and oil and some, and some garlic, right? Olive oil, extra virgin olive oil. But, but here's the thing. Uh, you, 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 you've seen pesto before that's been made with kale. It's been made with spinach. Instead of using the nuts, the pine nuts, you can sub it out with walnuts or pecans, etc., etc. So there's a lot of uh, uh, variety uh, or alternatives and variation when it comes to uh, sauce making. Uh, the other thing I would I would tell you is that one of the m most important things to create a successful sauce is is balance, and by balance I mean that sometimes uh, one tastes a sauce and says, "Hey, you know what? It tastes good, but uh, you know it's missing something," or "It tastes good, but it feels a little." I don't know, heavy or muddy. This is very simple, right? Because oftentimes what you'll discover is that you come to kind of the end of a recipe and you've tasted it along the way, but you taste it in the end and you say, hey, you know what? It's a little, I, I, it needs something. Now, sometimes that something is an addition. Generally, it is at this point. You kind of can't take anything out. And the addition can be as simple as uh, seasoning, you know, otherwise known as salt or pepper, or maybe it's the addition of some kind of fresh herb or, but more times than not, I think you'll discover that what it's missing uh, is acidity. And this really points to the importance of having in your kitchen uh, lemons uh, and vinegar because they are used uh, quite often to bring balance to a sauce that otherwise needs a little bit of a brightening, as they would say. Uh, and oftentimes, you know, a sauce can benefit from something as simple as water, believe it or not. Sauce is too heavy. You may want to add a little water to it and lighten it up. And, uh, you know, sometimes even a little bit of sugar. Uh, if a sauce, for example, is too, uh, uh, is too uh, uh, hot, uh, uh, picante, spicy, uh, one of the ways to temper that is with some sweetness, whether it's uh, sugar or honey or agave or whatever it may be. And um, I will also say, finally, on the kind of the general rule, of sauces that if uh, the subject matter of sauces is interesting to you, you might want to buy a book. And if you buy a book, 
the book that you're going to buy, uh, this is recommendation number two today, it's called Sauces. And the book is by a guy named James Peterson, who I know quite well because James Peterson was my uh, teacher in cooking school, my primary teacher in cooking school. Now, I only knew that he was a great cook. I knew that he had owned a restaurant. I knew that he was formerly a chemist, and those guys make very good cooks because they understand how tastes come together and how fire uh, and heat essentially uh, changed the chemistry of food. So he was great. But years after uh, cooking school, he published a book called Sauces, which is now considered the Bible of sauce making in the industry. It won every award that you can. It's sold uh, on Amazon and everywhere else. It's a, uh, it is literally the authority on anything that you want to know about sauce making. Let's cut to uh, marinara. Question number one. It, Rob, is there a difference between marinara and tomato sauce? And the answer is, uh, there actually is. Um, tomato sauce, believe it or not, is the more complicated one. Tomato sauce takes some time to make. Uh, it's made with uh, 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 mirepoix, you know, sometimes, uh, which which means, you know, onion and celery and, and garlic, and then the tomatoes go in and it cooks for a long time, etc., etc., etc. Tomato sauce, classically speaking, is a more complex, longer process sauce. Marinara, it's fast and easy. Um and it requires essentially uh, four ingredients. Uh, number one is decent uh, olive oil. And number two is some fresh uh, sliced uh, garlic. And I like to put in uh, optional, but uh, red pepper flakes, otherwise known as pepperoncino, uh, to bring a little bit of heat to the equation. And then the, um, the kind of last ingredient before you get to the salt and pepper, crucial salt and pepper, by the way, always in any kind of cooking, last ingredient before you get to the uh, salt and pepper, is the is the tomatoes themselves. And what you're looking for here are Italian uh, plum peeled tomatoes in a can. Italian peeled plum tomatoes in a can. Now, if you can get them from Italy and they come from the region of San Marzano, you, you're in good shape because those are the perfect uh, tomatoes to make a marinara sauce. But you, you can pretty much go to the uh, any supermarket and find four or five decent brands of, uh, of Italian peeled uh, plum tomatoes. Uh, they may or may not be from San Marzano, but in any case, that's the final ingredient. And all you're really doing here is you're frying up the garlic just a little bit. And when I say a little bit, I mean 30 seconds, 40 seconds until... It's fragrant. You don't even really want it to turn color. If Once it starts to turn, literally dump in the tomatoes and the tomato juice from that can right at this very instant to stop it from turning any more color. So we're talking about oil, heated, medium, uh, 30, 40 seconds to get, uh, to get a little bit of fragrance out of the garlic. Uh, a, a little uh, pinch of uh, peperoncino, red pepper flakes to your taste. And then the tomatoes go in. Now, do the tomatoes go in whole? And the answer is no, they don't. They actually get crushed uh, before you put them in. And how you crush them is uh, either uh, completely with your hands, which is an awful lot of fun to do, and will get you chunky, textural uh, uh, marinara sauce. Or you can do what I do, which is you simply put them in a blender, the whole can and the juice, and you blend the heck out of them, and then boom, they come out three seconds later completely pureed. And that mix uh, goes directly into the uh, the now fragrant uh, garlic, and you give it a little stir, and you put in a little salt and a little pepper, and you let it cook for, you know, 15, 20 minutes. It doesn't have to go longer than that. It's a marinara is a fresh sauce, and it's done. And at the moment that it's done, uh, you can take it off the heat and uh, and you can serve it. Uh, you can certainly put in, uh, either now or before, if you want, you can put in a little uh, fresh basil. That, that will not hurt you. But uh, there, with those four ingredients plus salt and pepper, you have uh, a, a delicious, uh, easy uh, marinara that you can use, uh, you know, whether you're going to make uh, pasta uh, you can put it on top of your, uh, you know, uh, pizza if you want. You want to make like a pizza bread, easy. Uh, you can use uh, that sauce if you want, for example, uh, ground up uh, some uh, meat separately. Any kind of meat uh, can be chopped meat, chopped steak. It can be turkey meat, whatever it is. 
and you can add that to the sauce, thereby getting yourself a meat sauce. Uh, I use that uh, that marinara actually to make a uh, shakshuka, delicious uh, Middle Eastern dish in which you essentially poach a couple of eggs in a tomato sauce. But you, in this case, you you know in that case you would add some other flavorings, Middle Eastern flavorings. Uh, but I, I the the bottom line is uh, always uh, make your own uh, marinara. It was just that uh, delicious and just that easy and just that few ingredients. Now, people. If you don't happen to like garlic, because I didn't even say how much garlic to put in. I mean, you can use one clove. I use probably four or five cloves. I just I like the garlic. How much oil? Honestly, again, uh, enough to make sure that you can uh, toast the garlic. More if you want to have a richer kind of olive oil taste in your sauce. So it could be anywhere from like a tablespoon to two or three tablespoons. The garlic can be anywhere from, you know, again, one slice clove to four or five, six slice cloves. Uh, how spicy do you want it? You can go no pepperoncino. You can go, I'm going to put in like, a, you know, half a teaspoon of this stuff, whatever. And I, I'll use one can of, uh, of the San Marzano tomatoes, and that's uh, enough for, you know, a couple, three, four people to have, you know, pasta. You can also make uh, a marinara sauce or a tomato sauce. Let's call it a tomato sauce. Uh, that doesn't use any olive oil and doesn't use any garlic, which is really kind of funny when you think about it. But because the sauce comes from one of the most uh, famous uh, Italian uh, chefs uh, in history, a woman whose name is Marcella uh, Hazan, H-A-Z-A-N, she has a very famous, uh, you know, tomato sauce that she makes that uses neither olive oil nor garlic, which is kind of funny, right? Because... She's legendary, but her sauce is quite famous as well. And all she does is she takes a half an onion, like a decent-sized onion, cuts it in half, peels it, puts it in a pot with a stick of butter, right? And then melts it, the butter down with the onion in there. Does what I do on the tomatoes, which essentially is puree nice Italian plum tomatoes. And the tomatoes go in there, and you add in your salt and your pepper. And to be honest with you, at that point, again, 15, 20 minutes later, you have a beautiful sauce. She tosses the onion. I eat the onion, because why not? It's delicious, surrounded by butter and tomatoes. What could be bad? But that also is a fundamentally different uh, kind of creamier, uh, richer in some ways, uh, a sauce, but an alternative, especially great for people who... You know, who say, hey, you know what, I don't, I'm not a big, huge, garlic-loving fan. Um, so those are two ways that you can make, you know, marinara tomato. And, you know, there is a third way, and I think it's worth mentioning, too. Uh, and it involves actually using uh, fresh tomatoes, but I use the little ones because they're always kind of tastier. The cherry tomatoes, you know, the grape tomatoes, those little tomatoes that you can buy. If you get a decent batch of those, uh, you can cook them one of two ways to make a sauce. An instant sauce. Very simple. Same concept. Uh, olive oil. And with the little, ter ter with the little ter cherry tomatoes, you can... If you cook them on top of the stove, you have a choice of whether or not you want to kind of split them in half or not. You could do it either way. There's something that they call burst tomatoes, in which case they let the actual whole tomato burst. And that's best done on top of the stove in a frying pan with some olive oil. And again, here, you know, uh, uh, a little garlic won't hurt you. Just make sure that you don't, you know, burn the garlic. You can probably put it in uh, at the same time as the tomatoes or toast it for, again, you know, 20, 30 seconds. Then the tomatoes go in, and you, and you cook them on a low heat until they burst. And if they don't burst, you help them a little bit with like a, you know, you press them down with a spatula or whatever, and salt and pepper go in. And again, you want spicy, you give a little peppercino. Uh, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So so that's an easy sauce that you could make uh, for an instant kind of a tomato sauce. And alternatively, you can take those same tomatoes, cut them in half, put them on a baking sheet, cover them with uh, olive oil and salt and pepper, and roast them in the oven for 20 or 25 minutes until they get all soft and uh, the, the, the juice is running all over the place. And you, you take the whole bunch of them that have cooked down there, 350, you know what I mean? 350, 375. It's 20 minutes. You can see that they cooked. You can see that they've released their liquids. Uh, and you scrape them all off that pan. You can serve them just as is. You could mash them up a little bit. You can add basil. You can add parmesan. You can add black pepper, whatever it is you want. But you can make uh, a roasted, uh, you know, uh, a cherry tomato sauce in no time 
with a box of cherry tomatoes, and it's delicious on, on pasta, on top of your chicken, on top of fish, whatever it is that you want. So that's that. Now, next up, I had promised uh, vinaigrette. And again, um, I you know, I start from the premise, which is you're kind of crazy not to make your own. It's just always going to be better. Um, essentially, you know, three, four, four ingredients, let's call it, plus, you know, salt and pepper, whatever. You're going to need uh, an oil and you're going to need a vinegar. And, and you don't even really need a vinegar because you can also make a vinaigrette with um, fresh lemon juice, in which case you'd have kind of a lemon vinaigrette, but either one works. You are going to need um, uh, an aromatic. Uh, and that means that, you know, that's, again, that's going to be a garlic or maybe shallot, uh, maybe a little red onion, something that brings a little boost of a uh, of flavor to the vinaigrette. And you're going to need um, an emulsifier or a simple way of looking at it is uh, a Dijon mustard. So now what I'm giving you here, and of course salt and pepper, the most important ingredients, I'm giving you the classic kind of um, like French vinaigrette uh, because I went to, you know, French cooking school. I went so that you don't have to. So I can tell you now here what you need to know. Like when it comes to oil, for example, you can basically use any kind of oil, right, in a vinaigrette. I don't care if it's olive oil. It could be avocado oil. You can use nut oils. I mean, if you want to make a kill of vinaigrette, go buy yourself some hazelnut oil. It doesn't last forever, but, man, it makes a kill of salad right there. And the same thing when it comes to vinegar. Yeah, Red wine vinegar, white wine vinegar, balsamic vinegar, sherry wine vinegar, super popular, champagne wine vinegar, and so on. Or, as I said, you know what? You don't love vinegar? I mean, I know someone that has, like, a vinegar-type allergy. No problem. You're using lemon juice instead. Uh, aromatic, again, uh, you're making vinaigrette. I think one clove of garlic is more than enough. Uh, crushed, you know, in one of those garlic press type things, great. Uh, a half a shallot, minced uh, very fine, is classic in French cuisine. Um, you could also probably use a little bit of, uh, of red onion if you want. I don't see why, uh, why scallion would be so bad. It wouldn't. Uh, when it comes to mustard, you're going to need about a teaspoon of that. Uh, and that wants to be real Dijon mustard, ideally is the best. You're not using French's, you're not using yellow. You go with the good stuff. Go with the French uh, Dijon mustard. And uh, then you're going to want salt and pepper. And so the question now becomes ratio. They teach you in cooking school that the classic ratio of a French vinaigrette is three parts of uh, oil to one part of vinegar, right? So that if I'm going to use like, uh, you know, one-third of a cup of uh, vinegar, I would use uh, one whole cup of olive oil. You don't have to do that. I find uh, two to one on on oil to vinegar is perfectly fine. And you may be making a, uh, a kind of a very rich uh, food. Forget salad for a second because the vinaigrette can be used on anything, right? But if you were making something really rich and you wanted to give it a little uh, sauce vinaigrette, as they call it, uh, you might want that vinaigrette to be a little bit brighter, as they say, a little bit more sprightly, a little bit more acidic, in which case that ratio can be one part oil to one part vinegar. So you have some latitude here. And once you blend that vinaigrette, which of course you can do by shaking it in a bottle, by stirring it with a whisk, by putting it in a blender, it matters not to me, they're all perfectly effective methods. Uh, that vinaigrette can be used, uh, as I said, on salad, it can be used on, uh, on uh, chicken, it can be used on fish, and most importantly, it can be adapted. So, for example, you are a curry lover, maybe you want to make a curry vinaigrette, and so you put in a teaspoon of, uh, of curry powder when you make your vinaigrette. Uh, maybe you want to get the taste of southwest uh, France, right? So you... You use uh, herbs de Provence, a blend of uh, uh, 10 or a dozen herbs from the southwest of France. So a teaspoon of that would go in your vinaigrette. And then you're all of a sudden you're having a, you know, kind of a southwest French vinaigrette. Or maybe you love, some people hate, but maybe you love cilantro. So you make yourself a nice Mexican vinaigrette. But uh, again, uh, bottom line is simple. Uh, easy to make. Uh, four kind of key ingredients. Call it a day. And, uh, and totally adaptable, better than anything you're going to be able to buy in store. Next up, let me tell you about um, pan sauce. And it's, and it's uh, frankly, the one that I make and use m more than any other. Because I, sp 
I love heat. I love fire. And I love firing up food on top of the stove. And anytime you fire up food on top of the stove or roast in an oven, you tend to get... Um, you tend to get the uh, little brown bits that show up in the bottom of the pan that you're cooking in, right? So if I have an entire chicken and I roast it in a, in a metal pan, not in a glass dish, by the way, but in a metal pan, a baking thing, sheet, um, and you take the chicken off, you know, you see this like, one of the things that's happened is that some of the fat has come out of the chicken. That's rendered, they call it, rendered fat. And then you see that there are brown bits, and those brown bits, otherwise known as I mentioned before as fond, F-O-N-D, bottom, uh, those brown bits are flavor bombs, and they are the basis for a shit ton, as uh, as the official word goes, of um, of sauce making. They are literally the key to so much sauce making, to start with the brown bits at the bottom of the pan. Now, the other concept that you become that you should become familiar with at this point is the process of deglazing. What does deglazing mean? It means that you're going to take some form of liquid. And when I say some form, I mean water. I mean stock. And then potentially other things like, you know, wine or bourbon, whatever we're going to use, right? And we're going to deglaze, which means we're going to add some uh, water uh, or stock or liquid uh, to the pan. And we're going to scrape up those brown bits. We're going to get them off the bottom of the pan where they're stuck and we're going to incorporate them and make them part of the uh, sauce. And we do this generally with a wooden spoon, right? We try to avoid the metal here. And one of the options that we have, even before we start the deglazing process, is to bring a little bit more flavor to the party if we're going to make a more uh, kind of a richer, deeper sauce. Now, uh, let me let me explain. If I roast a chicken uh, and I take it out of the roasting pan, I see in the bottom of the pan that there are brown bits. And I see that there's also a whole lot of like chicken fat. And my first job is to remove most of the fat. So in spite of what it is that you may have heard about fat and flavor... Uh, too much fat is not good for a sauce. But I would not remove necessarily 100% of it, maybe 90% of it, and I would leave a teaspoon or so of fat in the bottom of the pan. And I would use that teaspoon of uh, fat. I would now put this uh, pan on top of the heat before I deglaze, and I would consider it, and I would consider adding in at this point. So there's two ways here. You can either add in a little extra flavor right now, or you can go right to the pan gravy or the au jus. And I do that, right? So I take off the fat, and I will literally at this point add into the pan about a cup of water. H2 freaking O. And I take a wooden spoon, and I stir up all the brown bits. And the next thing I'm looking at right there is some kind of watery brown juice. And I cook it for a little bit longer because I wanted to cook. I wanted to actually reduce a little bit. And I taste it. And I taste it because I need to know whether or not I need to add anything in it to improve upon it. What would I add in? Salt. What would I add in? Pepper. Uh, what could I add in? Other things if I want to. But the classic, simplest, like roast chicken au jus, requires nothing more than taking... The, the fat from the bottom of the pan and eliminating most of it, adding a cup of water, using a wooden spoon to stir it around, deglazing, that is, and then creating uh, essentially the, the, the pan gravy, the au jus. I taste it. I, I may want to add a little bit of salt in. Here's another thing I may want to add in, and I, and I may want to reduce it. You know, if it's too liquidy and I want to intensify it a little bit and thicken it a little bit, I don't have to add in... A thickening agent. I don't have to add in flour. I like to reduce it over heat, let it intensify a little bit. That's fine. And then maybe at the end, I take like a little bit of butter, a teaspoon, a tablespoon of butter, and I swirl that in to give it a little sheen, to give it a little richness, to give it a little thickness, and I'm done. So 
the easiest way to do this is to make the au jus. It requires nothing more than water. If you want to do a more kind of intense, fancified sauce, you eliminate the, uh, the, the fat in the bottom of the pan, as I had mentioned, and you leave maybe a tablespoon of fat down there. And you can add in some uh, additional, what they call aromatic flavoring, right? Because you're going to put in maybe a little shallot or a little garlic or a little onion. And you toast it for nothing more than, I don't know, 30 seconds or a minute, right? And it brings super flavor. Then my liquid goes in. Now, again, if I'm doing the real simple au jus, the only liquid going in there is some water. But if I want to make a more intense uh, flavored uh, sauce, why not add in a cup of wine or a cup of, uh, of chicken stock, right? Now, then when you do that, you go, you know, that's pretty liquidy there. And so what comes next is the reduction, right? And so that means that it stays on the heat and it's bubbling and it's evaporating and you can see it going down to half what it started with, to one quarter of what it started with. And you taste it and you go, hey, you know what? And don't put in salt, by the way until after you've reduced it all the way. Because in the reduction, what happens is, and flavors get intensified. If you put too much salt in early, it can get a little salty. You don't want to do that. So if you're going to go for the more kind of the bigger sauce with the aromatics, with the stock, or the wine, or both, and you're going to reduce it down, let it reduce down. Taste it. And then at that point, when it's reduced to the thickness that it is that you like, you have the option of doing a little bit more, let's say, emulsification, which is to say that you can add in, at this point, some butter. Uh, you can add in some cream. Or you want to make like a nice, uh, you know, mustardy Dijon sauce. You can add in Dijon at this stage. Um, uh, and, and you can also, again, uh, kind of season the sauce, not only with the salt and pepper, but for hap but perhaps you feel like, you know, it would help to have a little bit of uh, parsley or, or maybe some freshly chopped, you know, chives or maybe a little bit of oh, tarragon, which you know I'm deeply in love with that that slight, but but awesomely delicious licorice taste. So that's all possible. Of course, you're going to taste for salt, and um, and there you end up with a beautiful. Uh, uh, pan gravy. That's how you do that. Okay, good. Let's move on to the, let's go green, as they say. Let's move on to the kind of couple of classic uh, uncooked sauces. The first one is pesto, which, as I mentioned, originated in um, Genoa, Italy, where they happen to have a ready supply of delicious basil, Great cheese, Parmesan, uh, pine nuts, superb olive oil, and garlic. And I have just given you all the ingredients that you need to make the classic pesto, which is to say fresh basil. Uh, how much? Well, it depends how much, obvious pesto you, know, you want to make. But let's say that you need um, a whole bunch of basil leaves. Um, let's call it. Let's let's say two cups worth on the basil leaves, right? So you're going to want a couple of bunches of, of basil. And this is going to make you enough pesto for, uh, you know, it's going to take only a few minutes, but it's going to make you enough pesto for plenty of people can eat this. And you're going to want pine nuts. And while you don't need uh, a lot of them, I would say a half a cup of pine nuts is good. And you're going to have the option with pine nuts of toasting them or not toasting them. And my suggestion is to toast them for no other reason than any time that you toast nuts, uh, officially known as kind of caramelizing them again because the, 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 the sugar uh, uh, kind of surfaces and, and browns, just beautiful. The thing about pine nuts is... Um, I I uh, I fail once out of every two times that I'm toasting nuts. Uh, half of them are great, the other half I burn. And you don't want to burn pine nuts because they're expensive. Even a half a cup probably runs six bucks. But anyway, you need pine nuts, a uh, half a cup toasted or, or not toasted. And you're going to need garlic. I'm going to say one clove is fine. You know, if you're a garlic lover, maybe you could put in more. Uh, you are going to need two other ingredients. You're going to need some olive oil. Let's call it a half a cup. It could be less. It could be more. The consistency is going to be a function, essentially, of your uh, preference. 
and you're going again, and you're going to need a grated Parmesan cheese. The better the cheese, um, the better your sauce. Uh, the amount of cheese again kind of varies, but let's call it um, a half a cup of olive oil here and a half a cup of a grated Parmesan cheese. And you're going to need, of course, as always, I feel like I don't even need to mention it, but I do, uh, salt and pepper. And all you're going to do, uh, really, I mean, as far as the process goes, is you are going to, uh, this is best in a food processor, if you can. You're going to take those pine nuts, lemon juice, which I didn't even mention, but I, I think I should because you're probably going to put, you know, like uh, two tablespoons of lemon juice, fresh lemon juice in the um, in this pesto. Throw in your clove of garlic, put in your salt, your pepper, and you're going to pulse it until it's nicely chopped, right? That's the, the nuts and the juice and the garlic, right? So the, the hard stuff. Then the basil goes in. You got a couple of cups of bagels, basil. Now, again, I've seen giant heads of basil. I've seen, you know, small little batches of basil, but basil's the key ingredient here. So you're going to want two cups of basil that's pretty well packed. It's clean. Um, you can certainly feel free to use some of the stems in there. They have a ton of flavor, so don't worry about that. It's all getting blended together. And then you're going to pulse it. So now that most everything is in there, the key now to making the sauce is to adding in the olive oil. And generally the way this is done is you keep the processor running, or the blender, whatever it is that you use, and you start to drizzle in that oil. And you keep pulse, pulsing until everything is combined. And you can see, you, you know, how much oil you want to add based on what you believe the creamy texture is that you want to have. But I would say a quarter of, you start with a quarter of a cup slowly, you get yourself to a half a cup. I think that's probably what you're going to need here. Um, and then at that point, when you see a nice uh, creamy sauce uh, brewing, um, you add in that grated Parmesan cheese, maybe a quarter of a cup at a time. Quarter of a cup first, then you pulse that, and then you can, you know, taste it and go, hey, that is freaking awesome, but I want a little more basil flavor. Great. Boom. I want a little bit more uh, olive oil in there to make it a little bit more gushy, a little bit more juicy. Fine. I want a little bit more Parmesan cheese in there to make it a little rich. And ladies and gentlemen, you have yourself a pesto. And as I said, you don't ever uh, have to cook it. All you have to do is have nice, hot pasta uh, uh, done uh, beautifully al dente, and you're going to add in this delicious uh, 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 pesto uh, sauce to it, and it'll kind of get all melty and yummy and, and just uh, awesomely delicious. If you feel that your sauce is too thick or tight, as they might say, you can take a little bit of the, uh, the pasta water and put that into the blender as well, just to kind of, uh, you know, loosen it up a bit. If and when it comes time to store your extra pesto, um, I would have you know that basil has a tendency to get black uh, when it's exposed to air. So the easiest way to prevent that is just by putting a layer of olive oil on top of the finished pesto before you put a, uh, a lid on it, put it in the refrigerator, and that'll prevent it from turning um, black. And then the next day you can kind of stir it up and use it all over again. Now, the thing about the uh, basil recipe uh, that I gave you is that it's so adaptable, as I kind of mentioned uh, early on when it comes to sauces, that you could make it, instead of using uh, basil, you can use mint, you can use cilantro, you can use parsley, you can use spinach, you can use kale. I've seen kale pesto. Uh, you can also make it with, uh, you know, arugula uh, and that kind of thing. You can... Uh, you can put, you can, you, you, you know, you can replace some of the basil with some other ingredients. So maybe you like artichoke hearts, or maybe you like red pepper, or maybe you want a little bit of avocado, which is really lovely and makes it all creamy. You don't have to use pine nuts, right? You want to use pistachios, you want to use walnuts, you want to use almonds, pecans, all good. And so those are all variations on the theme of a cold blended uh, sauce. But uh, as a purist, I love the original. Uh, Genovese, uh, you know, pesto. I had mentioned um, also up front 
Another uncooked uh, green sauce, which I've had a lot of uh, down in Argentina and in Uruguay, where they revere uh, their cooked meat. They just love the steak down there, and they have great steak out in the out in the pampas, grass-eating steak. It's delicious. Uh, they they put it on a grill, and um, and because you, you know steak is by definition kind of uh, rich, one of the ways they complement it. I mean, look, I, I I'm insulted by steak sauce uh, here. Uh, and whenever I see somebody use steak sauce, I think to myself, they have no. They kind of have no real taste buds, right? You you don't you don't want to be paying. You don't want to be paying uh, twenty dollars for a piece of steak and then basically end up sucking down a bottle of uh, Lee and Lee and Perrin's, uh, 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 you know, steak sauce. This makes no sense to me. However, when it comes to steak down there in Argentina and uh, and and Uruguay and even here in the United States, sometimes you get a beautiful piece of grilled steak, but you want to add a little oomph. To it, and there is no better oomph than authentic uh, chimichurri, which is again a no-cook green sauce of not a ton of ingredients, but rich. Well, no, no, not even rich. I mean, like spicy, intensely flavored, super bright vinegary sauce that will complement the steak. Uh, I mean, you can also you ever make like you know, pork chops and go, you know, I could use a little extra something here. Like I would serve pork chops with chimichurri in a heartbeat. So what goes into chimichurri? What are the key ingredients here? And the answer is you're going to want some olive oil, uh, half a cup, and you're going to want some red wine vinegar and you don't need a ton. It's going to keep a couple of tablespoons, maybe three. And you're going to want parsley. That's what's going to make it green. That's a half a cup or more of chopped parsley. I like the Italian flat leaf parsley for this, but the other is okay. This one's going to be garlicky. So you can mince or chop three or four cloves of garlic. Uh, you you want to go um, a little spicy on this. And there's two ways. You can go with some spicy red chilies and a couple of them if you want to make it like that. Or... It's quite common to make this with a teaspoon or two of uh, pepperoncino, the, the the red, you know, the chili flakes. You're going to want oregano, and I'm perfectly fine with uh, dry oregano. Just know that dry oregano is very strong, so you know you don't want to overdo that. So half a teaspoon or three quarters of a teaspoon of nice dry Mexican oregano is great. Uh, you're going to need a nice teaspoon of salt in this and pepper to taste, and that's all. Now, while it would be Super simple and completely acceptable to me. I'm not judging to make all of those ingredients in one place in one blender and you're done. The traditional chimichurri is actually made by hand. And so you take all the ingredients, you put them in a bowl, but it means that you have chopped up that parsley uh, finely. And so the oil and the vinegar and the parsley and the chopped up or minced the garlic and whether you use the chili flakes or the actual chilies themselves and some oregano and then your salt and pepper. And you just, you know, you, you just put that all in a bowl and, and let it sit there for five or ten minutes or even a couple of hours. So, you know, or you want to do it a day ahead and refrigerate it, you can do that. And while, while you can put the, uh, the chimichurri on top of a beautiful piece of grilled steak or pork, as I had mentioned, or chicken or pretty much anything else that you want, um... You can also use it. Nobody will ever prevent you from using it as a marinade, right? So you might want to, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, paint or uh, uh, baste your chicken or your meat and some chimichurri before you throw it on the fire. So that's how you do. That's how you do that. Now, in the few minutes that we have uh, remaining, I can provide you with three sauces that you can use. They tend to be what I call, <laughs> I guess, you know, single-use sauces. Um, in other words, the application generally of these sauces is relatively specific. But the beauty of them is that they do not take uh, many ingredients. They are basically... 
uh, two ingredients and one uses three. So let's start with the classic buffalo sauce coming to you from Buffalo, New York, where they have invented buffalo chicken wings at a bar, I believe, somewhere in the mid-60s, 1964. Buffalo chicken wings, they fried chicken, and they tossed it in sauce. And I'm going to tell you the sauce that they tossed it in. Uh, it's Frank's hot sauce and butter. Those are your two ingredients. And so all you do is get yourself a cup of Frank's hot sauce and get yourself a stick of butter and melt them and swirl them together. And you have buffalo sauce. So fry your chicken wings, uh, roast your chicken wings until they're super crispy, uh, roast chicken thighs, which I do until they are super crispy. And when they're ready, take them out and drop them into your... Buffalo sauce uh, made with the Franks and the butter and swirl them around until they're well covered. And there you have uh, buffalo chicken wings or thighs or, frankly, I made last week buffalo cauliflower. And it was really good, right? Super uh, crispy roasted uh, cauliflower, which you can do in the oven. You can do it in an air fryer. You can add some breadcrumbs to it if you want to give it a little bit of extra texture and whatever. And next thing you know... I toss it in that buffalo sauce, and people are happy. Serve it with blue cheese dressing. Serve it with ranch dressing. It's fantastic. Another two-ingredient sauce, uh, my friends, was uh, taught to me by uh, the lovely and talented uh, Giada De Laurentiis, who you may recognize from Food Network fame. Woman has an addiction to chocolate, but the sauce that she taught me was uh, Nutella sauce. You're probably familiar with Nutella. It is the hazelnut and chocolate sauce made in Italy. It is what I call the crack cocaine of the kitchen. And while I can eat it uh, straight up with a spoon uh, or, you know, smear it on something, I find that its best application is the way that Giada taught me, in which uh, you take an equal amount of uh, Nutella, let's call it a cup, and heavy cream, let's call it a cup, and you put that together in a little a pot on the stove and you swirl around until it has a texture of gorgeousness, smooth and delicious and pourable. And you pour that on anything. Pour it on ice cream, obviously. Pour it on a piece of pound cake. All of a sudden, you have a great dessert. And uh, I don't know, we'll just, uh, I don't know, take a, go back to the tablespoon method and grab a tablespoon of the stuff, maybe shoot in a little bit of cheap whipped cream and... You know, that's dessert for some people. Uh, and then finally uh, is the is the mignonette. Now, I, I even though I save it for last, it's kind of like not least. Uh, mignonette, you, you, if you look up mignonette, you essentially only find one reason to use it. And that's on raw oysters. So, you know, if you're a person that says, you know what, I'm not interested in oysters, you may not be interested in mignonette. But that's not to say that you couldn't use it for other um, uh, other things as well. But even if you just uh, were to use it for oysters, um, all you really need are three ingredients to make a mignonette. And uh, they would be a tablespoon of um, grated, freshly grated black peppercorns, right? You're going to need about um, a half a cup of vinegar. And that generally is red wine vinegar, but I mean you could use white wine vinegar or... I suppose like a champagne wine vinegar. And you're going to need two um, uh, tablespoons as well of uh, shallots that have been um, finely finely chopped. And that's it. You combine and you stir. And that's going to be enough uh, liquid there for a couple of dozen uh, oysters. But if you get your, uh, if you ever have fresh oysters, and I suppose it's fine on clams as well, you could probably use it on shrimp instead of using cocktail sauce. Uh, this is... Um, this is beautiful. It really brings out uh, the sweet uh, kind of brininess of these sea creatures. So black pepper, vinegar, uh, shallots will make you a vinaigrette. And so there you have it, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for this evening, an entire discussion on uh, Sauce Making 101, brought to you by me, Rob Rosenthal, your host uh, here on episode number 121 of All You Can Eat. Uh, the other 120 episodes can be found at this point on iHeartRadio, either by searching for All You Can Eat or Rob Rosenthal. Also available to you on uh, Spotify, uh, All You Can Eat, 
I suppose, would be the way to look for that. Uh, I do have a uh, book, if you want to see 100 of uh, my recipes and another couple of hundred pages on how to cook, called Short Order Dad, One Guy's Guide to Making Food Fun and Hassle-Free. You can find that on um, Amazon. And if you are interested, let me see if I can find uh, the link right here. Where would we find the link? And the answer is right here. Probably, if you're interested, I'm giving two more classes after the sauce making class. So one is going to be Midwinter Comfort Foods. Yeah, there you go. And that one's going to be on February 16th, 630. Where do you go to find that information? Uh, you go to 92y.org. www.92y.org slash 92u, like the letter U, like university, slash cooking, slash food, slash drink. 92y.org slash 92u slash Cooking dash food dash drink. You can see all the classes that are available, including the next couple that I'm giving. Uh, one on uh, midwinter comfort foods, and the other is going to be oh, on all the stuff that I learned in um, in culinary in cooking school, all the techniques. That's a good class too. Also February twenty third, if you're interested. Uh, right. So that is uh, everything for this evening. Sauce classes, fun and the like. Pleasure to be with you back. Uh, Back on uh, on soon. And uh, until next time, remember this, life is short, so never waste a meal. I'm the tip on Pan Man. I'm the tip on Pan Man. Ain't nothing gonna stick on.